Hey guys, this is Ryan, the anomalous ambassador of the airwaves, broadcasting from just south of Area 51 at the base at La Madre Mountain. Um, if you haven't gone over to Hero Paranormal yet, check it out. Go to heroparanormal.com and for the price of a boutique cup of coffee a month, you can access all the content behind the paywall, which there is a ton of it. You can also access that at Patreon. Just look for Hero Paranormal. This is sort of a, a wild uh, em emergency stream that I have to do for something of extreme importance, in my opinion. As you know, if you've been listening to my previous podcasts, I've been going into, you know, saying... Uh, how sad it is about Matthew, uh, well, Perry Chandler, if you want to go back to the Friends character. And um, he passed away over the Hunter's Moon in his hot tub. Now, leading up to that event, he had a lot of interesting Instagram posts, which were relevant. Uh, not only did one actually, one post have him in the hot tub, with the moon in focus in the background, but the hunter's moon is very esoteric in its symbolism. It is a moon that is so bright that the hunters go out to harvest and to kill or sacrifice. It, it's a moon, it's a sacrifice moon. It's, it's, it's a death moon. They go out to uh, hunt animals with the moonlight. That's the legend of the hunter's moon. Something very interesting, however, is that, you know, I relate a lot to uh, this person, Matthew Perry, because um, of a few things. Not only did he only have six years on me, he died at the age of 54. However, he is also um, a pretty amazing guy as far as his battle with uh, the inner workings of the mind, let's call it. He had an amazing um, book that he came out, a memoir of sorts, which many friends of mine have recommended, and the reading is impressive. It is called uh, Matthew Perry Memoir, Friends, Lovers, and the Big Terrible Thing. So the big terrible thing, what is that? That is the human experience, right? The um, And how we relate to it, how we deal with it, whether that be substances, hobbies, uh, everybody does it a little bit different. Now, he takes us behind the scenes um, of what his actual life was like. And there's a lot of things that are in with, held within those pages, which are hard to believe. Among those is the fact that he went to school with Justin Trudeau. And for those of you who have seen my other uh, podcast on Justin Trudeau, I highly recommend it. I can't go into it this time because it'll be a three-hour podcast. But um, he's very candid, very dark, and very funny. However, poignant in his memoirs, the way he explains his position and situation in the world. An amazing guy. And um, a riveting story. Regardless, his wife worked for Justin Trudeau's father, who was also prime minister, of, uh, she was the press secretary. So Matthew Perry's mother worked directly with Justin Trudeau's father. Where it gets really interesting is, and there's a lot of interesting parts of this extraordinary story, but for this podcast, where it gets very interesting is the fact that he beat up Justin Trudeau. And he beat him up because he was jealous. He was jealous that Trudeau was doing better at sports and other things than he was. And he and another guy, like, they beat him up. They beat Justin Trudeau up. And I guess um, something that's hilarious is Justin Trudeau later contacted him and said, hey, what do you think about a rematch? And uh, Matthew Perry, in his sly and ingenious way, said, you know, I think I'll pass considering the fact that you have an army at your disposal, which is true. Now, he comes from uh, Matthew Chandler. Let's just call him Chandler from here on out. It'll be so much easier. Matthew Perry or M.T. I almost want to call him Matt Man, and I'll tell you why. Let's go with Matt Man. Um, his recent Instagram posts were all about 
Batman. And he would post them, hey, I am the Mat Man. And he would show images of the bat symbol. Uh, he had a very interesting bedroom with like lights and, and stars along the top. And he would show the, the image of the bat symbol up on the wall and say, I am Mat Man. Don't worry, I got the streets tonight. You know, I've got things undercover you can all sleep. You can all sleep comfortably and not worry. I am the Mat Man. I've got your backs. And he was like that. He was he was a very funny but um, very dark individual. And I'll tell you why I think it's dark. As many know, he had a life-threatening health scare um, due to taking too many opioids, which let's face it, this country, many have taken too many opioids. He almost died. He had a 2% chance of living, according to doctors. His colon burst. And... Um, he shares this story and he talks about, you know, through his trademark humor, talks about the dark reality of having a 2% chance to live and how he got through that. But he did. He got through it. He also battled, intimately battled, addiction and alcoholism, etc. Which I, again, being, uh, you know, someone who is in recovery, I relate to. I relate to this. Interestingly, he could tell that he was on a different path than most. And very interestingly as well, he goes into an epic dark detail in his memoirs about a Faustian pact. And this brings me to something extremely esoteric because he shuffled between uh, many, many different characters, not just Chandler or Matt Man, but many others. And he had an extremely hard time dealing with this terrible thing, this, this, this human experience, right? This um, how to deal with it. Uh, but it, it, he goes in deeper detail. So let's get into what was going on with Matthew Perry, Matt Man, uh, before he got famous. He was on the worst rated television show ever. And um, that's not just my opinion. I've never seen it, not my opinion at all, but it really was the worst rated television show ever. It had images of Muammar Mo Gaddafi and then he died. And then later on, he was like talking after death about like, anyway, really bad show, which later actually predictably programmed his actual death, which is very intriguing and esoterically um, stunning. But this is par for the course when it came to Matt Man. So Matt Man, uh, before he got extremely famous, he was reading about somebody else who was famous. And, you know, he dropped to his knees in his own words. And he prayed and said, do whatever you will with me. Just make me famous. Okay. Now, in his actual memoirs, it says he prayed to God. But I want to point something out. It also says in his actual memoirs that he made, in his own words, a Faustian bargain, a Faustian pact. Now, this is um, very interesting because a Faustian bargain is a pact, a pact whereby a person trades something of supreme moral or spiritual importance, namely themselves, um, uh, such as the soul, for some worldly or material benefit, such as knowledge, power, riches, fame, fame. And the term refers to the legend of Faust, um, which is known as Dr. Faustus, a character in the German folklore who agrees to surrender his soul to an evil spirit and he does this so that after a certain period of time, in exchange for otherwise unattainable knowledge, magical powers, fame, wealth, etc., accessing everything the world has to offer, the Faustian bargain is made with a power that the bargainer recognizes as evil or amoral. Faustian bargains are by their nature very tragic by definition. They end in tragedy. 
and self-defeating for the person who makes them. Eventually, you know, it, it's not worth the deal because what is surrender, what is surrendered in the, in the bargain, in the Faustian pact, is ultimately more valuable than what is obtained, whether the uh, person entering that pact understands that or not. Typically, a Faustian bargain as well is made to the devil. So this is where things get interesting. A Faustian bargain is something that is made with an entity which is recognized as evil or immoral, such as the devil, a demon, or other entities, much like Robert Johnson encountered on the crossroads. Now, the crossroads and Robert Johnson are another interesting Faustian bargain because um, this is a gentleman who was literally not a great musician, Robert Johnson. He was a uh, blues um, artist. And what happened to Robert Johnson at the crossroads is quite literally not only outlined in his actual songs, but he says it, you know, uh, he said it openly. He said it in his lyrics and he admitted to it. He said, I went to the crossroads, I fell down on my knees. I went to the crossroads, I fell down on my knees. I asked the Lord above, have mercy now, save. Um, so let, let's get into this Faustian bargain. He afterwards said that he's sure that he made a deal with the devil. But he says, I asked the Lord above, have mercy now, save poor Bob, if you please. Yeah, standing at the crossroads, tried to flag a ride. Okay, a ride where? O-E, I tried to flag a ride. Didn't nobody seem to know me, babe. Everybody passed me by. Kind of like life itself, where you are going through life and you're not being recognized, right? Standing at the crossroads, baby rising, sun going down. Stand at the crossroads. I believe my soul now, poor Bob, is sinking down. Now, Bob may be an alliteration for his alter ego, his former self, maybe a friend, it doesn't matter. But he goes on and he says, I looked east, I looked west, I went to the crossroad baby, I looked east, I looked west. Now this has a lot of esoteric meaning because people looked to the east for knowledge and obviously to the west for fame. Um, so Lord, I didn't have no sweet woman, oh well, babe, in my distress. The crossroads are an alliteration for demonic entities being invoked for personal gain. And his other songs tell the tale as well. Hellhound on my trail, Hoochie Coochie Man, Born Under a Bad Sign. It goes on and on. Every single um, pointed alliteration to the esoteric in his lyrics talk about going to the crossroads, basically making a deal with the devil, and he admitted this himself, making a deal with an entity to be famous. And in the words of his friends, he was not, you know, he literally picked up the guitar and became the most amazing blues singer ever, just like that. It wasn't like, uh, you know, he went to school or anything along those lines. So the crossroads are where people go to make deals with the with the devil, so to speak, and to to get what they want, usually, namely, fame, money, etc. Um, in this key line of the song that is so central to the story, Johnson doesn't seem to be talking uh, to the devil because he says, I, "I went down on my knees and I said, Lord." Well, this is going to bring me to something also a bit of a crossroads, which is. If you're familiar with UFO of God, a book by Chris Bledsoe, um, I'm good friends with Ryan Bledsoe, his son. The Bledsoe family has had a lot of UAP and UFO scenarios in and around not only their family unit, but also their homestead um, in North Carolina. So um, they live in the Carolinas. And so they uh, were targeted by a variety of government officials. And this happens when you're into these things, trust me. When I purchased, um, when, I, when I first started researching Skinwalker Ranch full time back in like 2007, uh, 
full time. You know, this is after my experience in the late nineties. You know, it was in, it was it was itching at me, and I went up there full time. When I started researching this full time, I had tons of quote unquote men in black government types in front of my house, parked out front. Later on, I found out who they all were, mostly for the most part, what they were doing. But they keep tabs on people, and it's no different with the Bledsoe family. Uh, Chris Bledsoe, Ryan Bledsoe, the entire family were targeted by government officials um, when they realized that the family was not only witnessing things that were out of this world, so to speak, of a cosmic nature, but they wanted to know more. And in discussions with many of these individuals, one is a very important character in Diana Pasolko's book, American Cosmic. In the book, his character's name is Tyler Durden. We've all come to find, well, not everyone, but I've come to find out that this gentleman is actually uh, a, um, a NASA guy uh, who had held a ton of patents. And he wrote an amazing book um, talking about NASA. Um, he's an entrepreneur, and many call him the original Dr. Taylor from NASA. You know, not, not Dr. Travis Taylor, that, that's the decoy, but we're talking about the real deal Dr. Timothy E. Taylor. Um, Taylor's story is not that of a regular person, but a meta metaphor for how these things work. So let me, let me go back to what's going on with Tyler Durden, Dr. Timothy Taylor and his journey into the secrets of life. This is a guy who holds multiple patents. He would come up with these amazing, and this is well outlined in Pazulka's book, he would come up with amazing medical, biomedical inventions. Um, they would just come to him, he would, he would put them on paper, take them to market, and it would just work. Uh, many of his peers were shocked at how this would work. How, how in the heck are you going from here to here? Show me the process. There was no process. It was just downloaded. And he had these inventions, took the patents, made the products, made the money. Well, pretty amazing for a single individual and very fascinating the detail that he explains. And, and that is explained in the book, American Cosmic. This particular individual, among others, met with the Bledsoe family, going back to the Bledsoes. So they had a lot of interesting, amazing things taking place in and around their household, in the skies behind their home, etc. And, you know, they were a very religious family. Uh, I say were because they still are very spiritual, but they're, they're, many of their churches, religion, when it came to religion, people kind of shunned them. As soon as UFOs were involved, this was considered something demonic. What many of these government individuals, including Dr. Taylor, Dr. Uh, Timothy E. Taylor, a.k.a. Tyler Durden, and others, what these people started to tell them is to um, look, at, look at this higher power entity in a more advanced fashion. In fact, a gentleman from the CIA in particular uh, told them that, uh, well, let's back up a little bit. So look at, look at your higher power in a more advanced fashion. It's, it's more complex than we could ever understand. There's not necessarily just good and evil, right? There's a gray area in between. More importantly, it was brought to their attention that possibly this entity is one and the same. In other words, that the good entity and the evil entity may in some way, shape, or form be united. And uh, <clears throat> this was kind of a struggle for, you know, many people to understand when they're, when they're hit with this, when they're hit with this possibility. So um, not to go on a complete side note, but um, yeah, that basically uh, in, in, Ryan Bledsoe's exact words, they were told that God and the devil are the same entity. So this is from government types that they are being told this. Now, what's really interesting about that is that, no, you know, the, the, 
Oh, how do I go? There's there's many words that are involved with this. And semantics gets involved. And once words and semantics gets involved, everything turns into a big cluster. So, I know people of religious nature are going to jump on my back for even bringing this topic up. But it comes back to that man, Matthew Perry, dropping to his knees, saying what he said in his memoirs. You know, just do whatever you want with me. Just make me famous. Now, the same is true of Robert Johnson. Uh, when he went down to the crossroads, um, he dropped to his knees. And they both use the same format. You know, basically, they drop to their knees. They ask for something. So, this is where things get complicated. There's multiple names. There's the devil. There's Satan. There's Lucifer. And the big difference between many of these entities are just names. So the belief that uh, we've all heard of the Godhead, or I hope you've heard of the Godhead, but the term devil can refer to a greater demon in the hierarchy of hell. In other languages, devil may be derived from the same Indo-European word for diva. So God and Satan being the same codex entity. If you look at the Codex Gigas, the Devil's Bible, uh, it says that Jesus and Lucifer are the same entity. So we start looking at some of these correlations that are very um, shocking, you know, very shocking. Because in the book of Job, they are definitely presented as different entities. And it's worth a read. God gives permission to Satan to basically take everything. And um, this is when the sons of God, the sons of God, which again brings us to fallen angels, right? We have the son of God, Jesus, but then we have fallen angels as well. If you look at the hierarchy of angels, some of them came down. It's very confusing semantically, as I said before. So without getting too stuck in the weeds, this is not something I want to get stuck in the weeds on. The semantics are something that people could argue for millennia, and many are still arguing. I mean, just look at look at some of some of the more religious wars. So, the Lord basically said unto Satan, "Behold, all that he hath is thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand." So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. He basically, you know, said. <laughs> You can, you can do what you need to do, and um, you can have what you need to have. You are almost, you know, in charge of this material realm, according to many people. So, basically, it's kind of like saying the Easter Bunny and Santa are the same entity, right? Because we're talking about things we can't see. However, <clears throat> they represent something very different. One leaves eggs, one leaves presents. And you have to admit that interesting stuff happens when good and evil conflict. Uh, we are told in the story of Noah that this this divine entity, this, cre uh, this I don't want to go say creator entity because that would be El, and I don't want to get stuck in the weeds. El is the Sumerian god of creation. Okay, <clears throat> let's not get stuck on semantics. So the Bledsoe's were told by government types, hey, we're talking about the same entity when it came to these two. We have Robert Johnson, um, basically, with this Faustian pact of his at the crossroads, becoming famous, becoming musically amazing, blues player, one-man band. You know, he's a one-man band, album after album, amazing stuff. Very deeply uh, affected many groups, many blues singers, many jazz singers, including Jack Black of the White Stripes, for example, you know, just raw power musically. So could these be the same entity? Well, in the memoirs, it does say in his own words by Matt Man, Matthew Perry, that he, in fact, begged, asked this entity in a Faustian pact uh, for fame and got it. He got it. He got the most 
popular television show on the planet and a lead role. So it's interesting. It would seem to make sense. Perhaps these entities created sin in order that biological creations would actually do something rather than just sit around, you know, and be uh, boring, you know, just sit in the trees and eat, eat bananas. So joking monkey term there. Don't get me going on the whole Neuralink and all the monkeys that are sacrificed to figuring out how to use Neuralink because that's a whole other story. But it would seem to make sense that these entities, regardless of what you want to call them, let's just call it the hierarchy of cosmic intelligence, right? Entities that are above us um, in intellect, spiritual presence, form, power, etc., higher powers, um, so anyway, it would seem to make sense that these entities created sin. Let's call them entities instead of entity for those that are hung up on this, this semantics. That this entity would create sin so that these biological creations of theirs, us, namely humans, would do something to make it more interesting. Uh, similar to, you know, the Greeks explaining that the gods were watching humanity and would sometimes intervene. So instead of just sitting around and doing nothing, uh, this would make things more interesting. More interesting stuff happens when good and evil are involved. And it could also explain the wide range of treatments humans have received from different entities throughout biblical history. I mean, we, we have the flood narrative where the entire world is decimated and he, a favorite is picked. Noah, build the boat, put all the animals on it. I mean, if that's not a tragically um, dark story, I don't know what is. It may be the darkest story around. So Faustian bargains are usually, Faustian pacts are usually done with evil entities. Also, something to point out for those that are hung up on why Jesus and Satan are referred to as the morning star. They're both referred to as the morning star. I think this is where some people have gathered that uh, alliteration, that possibility, that um, symbiosis, right? And this reference to the morning star as an individual is in Isaiah 14, 12, and I quote, how have you fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn? You have been cast down to earth, you who once laid low the nations. So this is interesting because the King James Version, all the versions translate morning star as Lucifer, yet son of the morning. So it is clear from the rest of the passages that Isaiah is referring to Satan's fall from heaven. However, then we have this, Luke 10, 18. In this case, the morning star refers to, again, Satan. In Revelations 22, 16, Jesus unmistakably identifies himself as the morning star. That's Revelations 22, 16. Jesus unmistakably identifies himself as the morning star. So why are both Jesus and Satan described as the morning star? Well, the morning star could be many different things, right? And again, we're stuck with semantics. It's interesting to note that the concept of the morning star is not only the concept that is applied to both Satan and Jesus, but in Revelation 5.5, 5, Jesus is referred to as the lion of the tribe of Judah. So we use a lot, words are the hang up, right? Words are the mire, words are the weeds that we will get stuck in. That is why the Benedictine monks say nothing. They just don't. Um, and so, okay, if we have this study and revelations, biblical scholars saying, yeah, we're seeing correlations here. And that's not even going into the whole uh, deal with Faustian bargains. But we have a Faustian bargain made by Matthew Perry, Matt Mann which explains how, in his words, in his memoirs, that synchronistically, by happenstance, amazingly, miraculously, he became famous right after he dropped to his knees, said, do whatever you want with me. That's not exact words, but yeah, do whatever you have to do with me. I don't care. 
just make me famous. And it happened. That is a Faustian bargain. And then his life became chaotic. He had a, he had a lot of troubles, but he also was famous. He got he got what he wanted out of the bargain. Interestingly, um, this Batman alliteration that has to do with the Batman, because he was referencing the Batman, and actually in his Instagram he posted images of the movie on the screens in I believe it was his bedroom, but it was the Batman, the movie the Batman which has all kinds of esoteric uh, meaning, you know, because it's a dark movie. It's a live action, real deal movie that um, has esoteric meaning all over it, including MK Ultra, and I'll get to that in a minute. The MK Ultra aspect of that is, of course, the shooting in a theater which uh, involves somebody who believed that they were literally psychologically broken and had a very interesting history. You know, um, both parents were very interesting. Uh, the esoteric secrets are very interesting. And I don't want to go down the dark tale of, you know, mass shooters with dyed orange hair in, uh, you know, and how this relates to Batman, but it obviously happened at this movie. So... Okay, Batman has a lot going on. His only superpower, right? He's not like other superheroes. His only superpower is his wealth, right? His wealth, his, his money, his fame, his whatever you want to call it. His only superpower is material. His materialistic superpower is what makes him a superhero. Where if you have all the other superheroes, you know, we're talking about mystically granted amazing powers with Superman, Flash, you name it, Wonder Woman, Spider-Man, everybody else has physical amazing powers that they can do things. Wolverine, they all have these, like, they're superhumans, but not Batman. Batman's a human. He's just a human. Batman is just a human. His only superpower material wealth, which allows him the fortitude to purchase things that are te technologically dazzling, gives him faster vehicles, cooler motorcycles, um, and, and which brings me to the spiritual meaning of Batman or Matman, because there's a lot, I hope you're seeing the correlations between Batman and Matman. So Batman symbolically represents the darkness that is in all human beings. Not just potential darkness, but the darkness that is factually in all human beings, whether we acknowledge it or not. So getting back to Matman and uh, his memoirs, he described this to a T. He described this to a T. The... <laughs> You know, it's sad, but the big, terrible thing, the, um, the darkness, not just potential darkness, but the darkness that is in all human beings, whether we acknowledge it or not. And the movie Batman kind of plays off of this darkness. It's, it's set in a very dark uh, way of filming. And the mythology of Batman is also somewhat dark, you know, um, almost, almost satanic. I mean, he's much like a vampire, right? He encompasses the use of the bat. He uses night to do what he needs to do. He does his bidding at night. That's when he's most powerful. And the mythology involved with him, in essence, he's, he's a common person with no special powers who finds his bliss to the heroic tasks of being Batman or Batman and uh, he serves as a symbol of what the common person can do in reality using a negative, pivotal life experience to do something positive, much like Matman. He had negative, pivotal life experiences, which then allowed him to do something positive. His memoirs are amazing. He's reached out to a ton of people in recovery, in addiction, 
with their own problems. And his memoirs, I've, I literally have seen people who have read his memoirs bawl their eyes out. And it's because, you know, he, he, he does a good job of explaining his own plight, his own humanity, and his own uh, dealing with the big terrible thing. Um, and, and, and he goes into friendships, lovers, strange possible connections with Illuminati. Yeah, I mean, most powerful, most powerful TV show on the planet, most popular TV show on the planet. Chances are this guy went to some parties. Chances are this guy saw some things. Chances are this guy saw true, real power in an Illuminati quote-unquote sense, right? And getting back to the Batman, even the movie, The Batman, and why is he using these these Instagram posts um, with Matman? I think there's something to this. And not only something to this, but he didn't post all that much. However, leading up the couple of weeks before his death, he posted a lot more percentage wise. So there was a lot more posts and, and they were a lot different than usual, really specifically pointing out this, this symbology of Batman. And, um, he had a pumpkin, for example, carved out in the shape of the Batman symbol. And, um, and he, he, he would ask questions like, I'm the Batman. Do you understand? So, very interesting, which brings me to, you know, Batman comics, of course, and in the deeper dive of all this, why so much deep, deep Batman, quote unquote, Batman significance and symbology the last two weeks of his life, specifically with Instagram posts of him in eerily in the hot tub that he ended up dying in with the moon in focus behind him. Uh, explaining the swirling warm waters and how they feel good. And then other posts with the Batman and the, the mythology around Batman. Well, Batman comics revealed that Bruce Wayne lost faith in God after the death of his parents. And how he tried to find something else to believe in. He didn't believe in God in a traditional sense, but basically was somewhat believing in himself, right? And this comes back to dark adepts using the darkness of night to do good things, heroic deeds by himself with his material power. So Batman is sort of a dark character. In fact, he is a dark character. Is he my favorite superhero? I think he is. And um, because it's not what you are, right? It's what you do. And he's an esoteric hero, which in my opinion is very interesting as a human being to, to be an esoteric hero. You know, how is it possible that an enormously successful billionaire Bruce Wayne who is surrounded by, you know, all of the best stuff, all the toys, all the glam, all the glitz, all the women in a huge house up on the hill, enormously successful, would want to do these things at night, these heroic deeds that he knows intrinsically are good, but does them under the cover of darkness and is almost an anti-hero. He's almost an anti-hero apart from you know, socially not fitting in in some way, shape, or form because he is does this under night. He doesn't want the fame. He doesn't want, you know, or what I mean by that is Batman could care less what people think about him. He's just utilizing the dark to get to the light and do something worthwhile. Very uh, anti-egalitarian, I guess. And the Dark Knight trilogy is one of the most successful movie franchises of all time. And when you analyze it, there's a reason. Because Batman is self-identified as a dark, almost anti-hero entity. 
And the success of the series comes from, I think a lot of people can understand that. You know, it's almost uh, getting back to the Faustian bargain. It's almost a Machiavellian thing. You know, the ends justify the means, you know, uh, which don't get me into the, but whether or not this is, this is right or wrong, but if the ends justify the means, if you can do a good thing, but you have to kind of act a little bad to do it, is it worthwhile? I don't know. You'd have to ask the Batman or the Matman. So these, um, these, these dark esoteric posts by Matthew Perry on his Instagram, well, I, I think they're esoteric because a lot of them revolved around darkness, around Batman, um, many questions, like, I'm the Matman, do you get it? Do you understand? Which nobody understood. I mean, I didn't understand. I, I don't think anyone still completely understands what that means. However, given the situation of what has taken place now, I think people are starting to understand that, um, you know, he he had some interesting points uh, with his Faustian bargain that he outlined in his memoir, you know, that he basically said, you know, I'll do whatever you want with me. I'll give up anything. Just make me famous. He had some interesting connections to world-class power elites in his background um, with his mother working for the prime minister and then him literally just beating up Justin Trudeau, who is a known World Economic Forum puppet and a super-class elite who has been able to get away with doing all kinds of dark things, uh, according allegedly, according to many Canadians where other people can't, you know, because he is a member of these circles. And you'll have to hear my other podcast on Justin Trudeau that just goes straight down, angled right at Justin Trudeau, the pig farm incidents, um, the nighttime raves, the friends that are involved with pedophilia. It goes on and on and on. But is Matthew Perry, you know, someone who has seen the darkness, touched the dark, been in close proximity to the darkness. And what did he do? He beat Justin Trudeau up, much like Batman. You know, uh, maybe there was some jealousy involved. According to the memoir, there was, and he had a lot of childhood ambition for fame. And um, he he took us along this journey in his memoirs. I, I have a feeling that these memoirs are going to really explode as far as sales after his death. And you know, it's a good memoir. I think there's nothing wrong with that. It's just too bad that it's going to happen after he passed instead of before, which is very often the case. So, yeah, that's 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 kind of sad. Um, let me adjust my lighting here. Okay, well, he had the the highs of low, the lies of the the lows, the highs of the highs of life. Gosh, can't get my mouth to work. I need some more coffee. Actually, I haven't even had coffee this morning. I'm so riled up about this. I usually have to have two, three cups before I even get going. This story, these posts on Instagram with the dark hunter's moon in the back, a sacrificial moon, very ritualistic that somebody would die in the water. Um, and during a dark moon, you know, the dark night, uh, again, back to Matman and Batman. But um, Solomon's Temple, actually, speaking of ex esoteric items, Solomon's Temple had a, a bathtub. I know that's not exactly a hot tub, but it's very simple and similar. But it's a way of washing away your sins, you know, you're in when you die that way, which is very ritualistic and biblically, uh, you know, this was the first house of the sanctum, Solomon's Temple. And they had a bathtub for the for the sorcery for the people to use before the ritual, you've heard cleanliness is close to godliness. Well, literally, you would cleanse yourself before contacting God, before seeing God. And that was the ritual of Solomon's temple bathtub. And that's um, pretty amazing because uh, it was, you know, bronze, in according to many, a bronze basin, which held um, the water for, for one to, to cleanse themselves before contacting God. Similar to a bathtub, right? 
and uh, it they they claim that it had there were more. Uh, some claim that um, the Solomon's Temple had many vessels, bathtubs within it, and uh, that these were for the purpose of cleansing oneself. And yet here we have the in the dark night, during the hunter's moon, a, a night of sacrifice, a night of moonlight, which the moon powers are extreme at, at, during that night. Um, it is a night of death. The hunters go out to reap, you know, what is in the forest. Uh, he is, Matt Man is out at night, literally on a ritual night a full moon, he is in the water, he is encountering the darkness, yet in full light, and he is cleansing himself before literally seeing God, doing the ultimate passage, the ultimate connection to God, which is death. So I think there's a lot of, uh, <clears throat> a lot of chronicling here, a lot of dark esoteric meaning to his posts about the map man if you look deeply at it maybe i'm overlooking it maybe i'm looking i'm sorry maybe i'm looking too deeply into it but i find it intriguing that he didn't post that much and then the two weeks before his death he's posting non-stop about the map man and um his memoirs are amazing highly recommend those wish wish everybody would read those and um this is, this is how this gentleman passed. I find a lot of, you know, way too young, way too soon, 54 years old. He only had six years on me and uh, way too young for anyone. However, maybe he knew more than we gave him credit for. And we don't know all the actual facts yet. They keep coming out slowly, but I think that there are relative dimensions to Solomon's Temple, the Faustian Pact, uh, getting what you want in exchange for something else, and how it all leads us eventually to that connection with God, whether esoteric or not. It may get deeper, there may be more, but for now, those are a lot of dark esoteric pathways for one to explore on the interesting life, and subsequent death of an amazing guy. And um, with connections to all kinds of amazing things and uh, fame beyond worldly recognition, really. So may he rest in peace. And um, yeah, check out his memoirs if you have a chance. Until next time, keep your eyes to the skies, feet on the ground, but don't forget to take a look around.